lobbyists, which is the biggest lobby group, far more than the next slide, far, far more you'll see it in the defense industry, or manufacturing, or agriculture, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Medicare administrative costs run about 2%. Commercial health insurance industry is 20%. Now think about that for a moment. That means every dollar that you have in a private health insurance, 20 cents has nothing to do with health. Nothing to do with health at all. Next one. It has to do with marketing, with advertising, profits. It is not related to your health. 20 cents out of every dollar. This is what I meant when I said I'm going to be controversial. I see no advantage to the commercial health insurance industry in America. Europe does not have that. They're all non-profit insurance entities. They are not for profit. Why do we have to make health care into a commodity in which people make money? Next slide. So we need to redesign health care for not just all Americans, but for all Americans. Next slide. Just a word on research and development, since that was my own historic background. And I mentioned already the extraordinary fact that more and more it's being determined that we can actually slow aging. Not reverse it, not stop it, but slow it. And the good news being that at the same time you delay the onset of the terrible age-related diseases. So some of us have gotten together and feel there should be further support of such studies, which require studies in the basic biology of aging. For example, why is it that 80% of all cancer occurs after 60? Why is aging such a powerful factor with regard to Alzheimer's disease, coronary heart disease, and other conditions? Shouldn't we know more about the basic biology, the underpinning that occurs in all of us? Now, what happened made sense in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, post-World War II. The leadership of the National Institute of Health made a pretty conscious and I think wise decision to point disease by disease in terms of financial support. And every institute at NIH, the Cancer Institute, the Heart Institute, have a direct budgetary line to Congress. So that means if a family has somebody suffering from juvenile diabetes, a 10 year old or whatever, they can go and make their wants and needs known directly to Congress. This is powerful. There's never been anything quite comparable to the guard to aging, in part because the public widely believed you can't really do anything about aging. So it's beginning to change now. So I think it's time to not dismiss the disease mission institute entities at all, but to supplement them with more attention devoted understanding aging itself. So we've written two papers that pursue this topic. Next. I hate to say that we have not had the progress that I wish we would have had if we got Alzheimer's disease. It's tough. The brain is our most complicated, complex organ in our body. We only spend at the National Institute of Health $1.5 billion dollars studying all aspects of the brain. Cancer, we spent five billion. Neurological conditions, one point five. I'm not at all negative towards five billion dollars being spent for cancer, but I am concerned that we're not spending enough to understand the most profound and most important part of our bodies, what makes us think, how we perceive things, how we process information and memories. And we could have an estimated 14 million people with Alzheimer's disease by 2030 if we do not find a means of prevention or a means of treatment. It's very hard for me to imagine how, as a society, we can handle that unless we do provide the proper support. Next slide. And I'm going to end on a very positive note, a little bit tough, I guess, and that is the baby boomers. You know, today, Another 12,000 will turn 63. In two years, they'll be getting Medicare. They already could have taken their Social Security. They will make up 
20 plus percent of the population being over 65 in less than 20 years. They could be very transformative. They could be a very powerful political force when they realize what's happening to them. My only concern is they themselves may not benefit as much as the, the polymer because overnight you can't solve major scientific problems like Alzheimer's disease and cancer. You can't overnight get doctors properly trained to take care of older people. But they could be a very important forward wedge and make a huge step in helping us to really confront this remarkable revolution in longevity. Next. So we also, I think, in the 21st century are likely to gain even more life expectancy because of what is called genomics, which is gene-based medicine. For example, those deaths that I mentioned from drugs, once we're able to identify the genetic susceptibility of individuals, we don't have to get a medicine that will kill them. That will be past history. And regenerative medicine, the capacity to grow new cells, that would place the missing cells in the brain that has to do with Parkinson's, the cells in the retina, which lead to the most common form of visual impairment, macular degeneration, the loss of the beta cells in the, in the pancreas that are related to diabetes. All of these may be subject to replacement in the next 10, 20, 30 years. So I think it's likely in the 21st century to have an additional growth in the population of older people. All to the good, in my judgment, so long as they're healthy and so long as society wakes up to the need to undertake fully comprehensive efforts to address the issues that are posed by the growing numbers of older persons. Thank you so very much.